week three, I want to bring you into the habit of paying attention to your narratives. Paying attention to your narratives. I want to ask you a question. All three locations. This is this. Have you ever found yourself having a conversation with yourself? Don't say it out loud. It's okay. Maybe once a day. Maybe twice a day. Maybe three times a day. If it's more than four times a day, you need help. Okay? You need help. But have you ever found yourself having a conversation with yourself? I mean, we've all have done it. For me, the time where I really have most conversations with myself is in the car, driving my car. I do a lot of driving. I live in Dunshockland. Navin's my location, but also I have my ministries, not just in, in those towns, but all across the country with CCI. Um, so I drive a lot, and often I catch myself having a conversation. But just the other day, I had this, this reality check. I'm driving down the motorway on the speed limit. Okay, I promise you, 120 kilometers an hour, maybe 121 kilometers an hour, and uh, I'm driving this high-powered machine, you know, it, you know it's a car, it's, it's a big Jeep, it, if, if I just derail left, right, I can hit someone, I can crash, I can crash into someone, but I just realized the other day, I was driving on the motorway, and I started having a conversation with myself about two minutes, and suddenly I just clicked back into reality and go, oh my goodness, I've been driving this car at this speed for the last two minutes, and I haven't even been aware. I wasn't even aware of the cars that passed me. I wasn't even aware of where I was going. I was caught up in having a conversation. So just be aware. If you see me in the motorway, just be careful, okay? But I find like myself, I'm having these conversations and, and they often go like this. I really should. You know, I really should go to the gym or I, I really should go and talk to that person or, or I really shouldn't. I, I really shouldn't do that or I really shouldn't go to that house or go to that place or I ought to. I ought to start reading my Bible or I ought to start getting to more you know, to church services or to serving or I better not, I better not go near that person, I better not go, go near that, that place because it ain't good to me. We all have these conversations, good and bad, and some of us have it a lot more, either in the shower or you're walking to work. But as human beings, we do this all the time. We have these conversations with ourselves. But what's so fascinating though, if you're here today across our three locations, if you are a materialist, now when I say materialist, I don't mean if you, if you gather collective stuff, but actually a materialist by belief. If you are a materialist, okay, materialists believe that there is no soul, there is no spirit. Materialists believe that there is no self, that you are just a collective of, of, of just, you know, gunk and, and blood and skin, and you know, and uh, that's all you are. You're born with that and you die with that. If you're a materialist, you believe, man, there is nobody in, inside of me. There, I'm, just a, I'm just a body living this life and it will go. And Christopher Hitchens, a great author, a British author, I said this in one of his books. He wrote 18 books, by the way, and they're fantastic. But he said this, you don't have a body, you are a body. He summarizes the, the, the belief of materialists that you don't have a body, you are a body. Meaning what he's saying is there is no you. There is no Sam, there is no John, there is no Sean, there, there is no you. But I, I beg to differ with that point because I have to ask this question and so do you because we all understand being human, somebody is talking in the inside. If there is no me, if there's no you, if there's no one inside, then who the flip is talking? Who has come into my body and taken over this thing? Who is talking to me? And the question we have to ask is why? Why is someone talk why are we talking to ourselves? Why do we do it all the time? Well, reality is it's called internal narratives. Everyone say internal narratives. We have something called internal narratives every day. When you go to work, when you go to college, when you go home, when you go to the gym, when you go to church, every day we have this thing called internal narratives. Now you may think, Sam, I would never talk to myself. I am not that crazy. Tell you now, watch this. Here's how I know, here's how you know you have internal narratives. Have you ever said to yourself, I deserve better? I deserve a better job. I deserve a better home. I deserve a better person, a better marriage. Or I'm entitled to. I've worked hard. I've done the hard work. I've been in this company for 20 years. Or I've done this for many, many times. I'm entitled to. Or I'm just not happy. I'm not happy where I am. I'm not happy with my marriage. I'm not happy with my family. I'm not happy with my life. Or she should be. If, if she, she should be this kind of way, or, or if he loved me that way, if he really did give me his time, or perhaps no one cares, no one sees me, or it just doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter at all, or it's just once, YOLO, who cares, just once, I'll just do it once, and, and you know what, no one will know, it's my, my little secret, or, 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 or no one will ever know, or why am I this way, why, why am I wired this way, why do I think this way, why do I operate this way, 
or I can't resist. Come on, all of us through fasting this month, there's a lot of resistance and temptation. I just can't resist him, her, that thing. Uh, something is wrong with me. Something is bothering me. Or I'm better than them. Or they're better than me. Or if my parents hadn't have done this. Men. Women. Men. If men were just more better. Or, or, or women are all just fill in the blank. I won't say it. I don't want to get in trouble. Foreigners. Oh, the foreigners. They've come. Taking over our country. Or these, those people. Or we are better. We are better than those people. See, quickly you realize we all have internal narratives. You can relate to all these statements. Why? Because you have said them to yourself some way or another. But here's the point. Narratives can create excuses. The narrative that you have going on in your mind can create excuses. Narratives can justify your actions. It, you sell yourself out by your own narratives into your decisions. But here's the tension with internal narratives. Often, if they're not checked and not, not, not well, they're illogical and they're irrational. They're selfish. They're all about you and how you feel. It's not about how the world is, but how you are. And often, if we're not being careful, these internal narratives can be illogical and irrational, and often they can cause destruction. Okay? But also, narratives are shaped, because they shape us, are shaped by who and where we are in the world, are shaped by how you were raised, by your parents, by your siblings, and also where you're from. If you're from, not from Ireland, from a different country, you have internal narratives, and you've been shaped by them. Why? Because of your culture or your context. Okay? But here's what you need to know. Here's something that's very important for you guys to know today. Your internal narrative shapes your decisions. How you see the world, how you see that person, how you see those people, how you see your spouse, how you see your children, how you see God, how you see church, how you see whatever is shaped by, uh, by your internal narrative, which ultimately leads to your decisions. Your internal narratives, actually, internal narratives can make you become your own worst enemy if we're not careful. If you were just to stop and reflect on your worst decisions and your worst choices, and if you could remember and recollect the time of, of what were you saying to yourself? How were you justifying those choices? What, what was being spoken in your mind? Because you can track back and you can say, yes, there were some internal narratives that were taking place in my mind that were illogical, irrational, and ultimately have led me to this place of regret and destruction. That is the reality of being a human being, people. No matter your faith, no matter who, you know, where you're from, how long you've been in church, we all experience this tension of having internal narratives. Now here's what I love about the Bible. The Bible today speaks right into this, right into the tension of being a human being, also with the, with the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian inside of you, but as a human being in general, the Bible speaks clearly into how do we counteract those internal narratives that are not healthy and that are flawed. And the Apostle Paul Apostle Paul, the famous Apostle Paul in the New Testament, pretty much wrote uh, all the epistles. Uh, he, he has an amazing story. He was once named Saul, and his journey was to try kill Christians. Come on, yeah, that's a good start, right? Paul, uh, Saul desired to kill Christians. He desired to go to the houses of men, women, and children and drag them out and persecute Christians. He was a devout Jew. He really believed in the Jewish faith. And there's obviously a very famous story that we know in culture, that was coming from the Bible, you know, of, 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 of the uh, road to Damascus. You know, Saul is there and he gets knocked off his horse because Jesus encounters him and you know, his life changes. Jesus calls him Paul. And from that moment onwards, Paul just gave his life to Christ and to building his church. So the Apostle Paul is on this journey of, of really sharing and spreading the gospel all across, you know, the Mediterranean areas. And uh, he, he ends up in Corinth, Greece. In Corinth, Greece. Now, I, I actually got to visit here last year. And it was an incredible place to go see ancient Corinth and really see and, and track the steps of Apostle Paul and, and, and even in, in Athens itself. And it just really brought those scriptures to life. But Paul has now gone to Corinth at this time. And Corinth was this like major metropolitan, very busy, very exciting, very successful city. It, it was really a place where that, that, that kind of connected Rome to, to the Middle East and, and, and Corinth was in the middle of all that. So it was literally roads coming from the left to the right and people loved it. There was a lot of money, a lot of wealthy people. Education was a, a high priority or two. So Paul has found himself now in, in Greece and in, in Corinth. But he, he, he's also facing, you know, the tension. This is a new culture, this is a new context and he's bringing the gospel. And, and in a minute I'm going to share the verses but I want to give you context that Paul's going to use 
something called military terminology, okay? Uh, so for those who are not aware of military or as part of like, oh, what does it mean to go to war? Paul's going to use these uh, expressions and these nuances that make sense to people who were in the military. And he kind of used them to kind of give us an idea, a, a great picture, a great scope, how to tackle in inter- internal narratives. Now, the, the culture of, of Corinth was mainly influenced by Rome. At the time, Rome was the superpower, took over the world. Now, the Roman worldview was quite different to the standards and values that Jesus has set. The Roman worldview is, is like this. It says, you know, if you're part of the Roman worldview and you're part of Roman culture, this is what it means part of the Roman culture. Might is better than right. So if you have money, if you have accolades, if you have prestige, if you, if you have successes, you can be right all day. But does that mean anything? Why? Because you have might. You have, you're bigger. You're grander. If you're part of a family that's a long lineage of being part of the Roman family, like, you know, uh, uh, um, politicians, you know, aristocrats or, you know, uh, people who are part of the military. You know, you, obviously there was prestige and there was privilege. But when it came to the Roman culture, it really didn't matter who you are. It really mattered who you were part of and who was your family. Number two, bigger is better. So the bigger the house, the bigger the place, bigger the horse, bigger the car. It was all about what you had. It was all external. How You showed off how you lived uh, to everyone else. All about pride, all about ego, okay? Uh, the gods determined the fate of individuals. So in that time in Rome, it, it, wasn't, it, was, it was polytheistic, okay? So they didn't believe in one god. They believed in many gods. And the whole idea of these many gods that, you know, it, 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 if a god was angry at you and if you got sick or if your mother, if your mother died or your, your child was not well or if you lost your job or if you're beaten up, really it was the gods. The gods determined that because they're not happy with you. You know, if you just got, like you lost all your money tomorrow, it wasn't because someone robbed you because the gods determined that you don't deserve that money anymore. And if something bad happens, it's your fault. We should connect to the gods. Like if you did something wrong, if you get sick, lose your job, whatever. It, the people don't think like, oh, poor you, feel, feel sorry. It's more like, hey, it's your fault. Get up and, and move on. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6, Paul is using this military terminology to give us uh, tools, to give us again a perspective. Of how do we tackle our flawed internal narratives? How do we tackle this thing that allows our minds to wander and ultimately leads down to a place where we can become our own worst enemy. So if you were tracking along in the Bible app on version, our notes are there. It's going to you version. Click more, click events, and all our notes are there as well. But of course, I'm going to have it on the screen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. Verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Apostle Paul says we are about a different war. Like obviously we live in a day and age where we see the, the war in Ukraine against Russia, See what's happening in the Middle East right now. You know, war is, is, is everywhere. And we understand that war, the world, is all about weapons and bombs and helicopters copters and guns. You know, but Paul's saying that we're, the war we're about is not the, not, not the wars of this world. It's a different war. What he's saying is that we're actually in a battle for our minds, our soul, and our spirit. We're not in a war to kind of, you know, increase our land or to take over other countries. We are in a battle. We're in a different war when it comes to our, to our minds, our souls, and spirits. Every day, if you're here and you're a Christ follower, and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, who is constantly, you know, making you more like Christ, you know, through reading scripture, and through soaping, and through, you know, being involved in the connect group, and, and, and even serving if you can, and of course, you know, attending church. You know, every day you wake up, it's a battle. Every day there's a gravitational pull of just your body, your flesh, trying to pull you, pull your mind, pull your soul, pull your spirit away from you. And Paul is saying, we, 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 we have a war, it's not of this world, it's different. It's in verse 4, it says, the weapons, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. We don't fight with guns. We don't fight with rockets. We don't fight with those things that we see. In the, world. the weapons we fight are very different. Hey, push, 21 days of prayer and fasting. That is a weapon that we are using. Come on, church. To fight back against the enemy, take control of our souls, our minds, our spirits, and say no to the devil. We are taking ground. Come on. That's why we're pushing. That's why we're praying. That's why we're believing during the next three weeks that we would encounter God in new and fresh ways. That is a way we fight this war. But on the contrary, they have divine power to, mo- to demolish strongholds. On the contrary, they have divine. Now, divine means it comes from God, not from you. How many of you know you're not powerful? <laughs> we are weak. And, we, and if you have faith, you know you need God every day. And if you don't have faith, you need to know you need God every day. Okay? 
But, but Paul Paul saying we have this divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, what is a stronghold? I'll show you a photo here. This is what a typical stronghold would look like around a castle. You see this in movies and shows. But a stronghold is designed to protect the inner keep, the inner castle, the king and queen, whoever's in there, okay? So surrounded by the castle, there are these high walls that would be there to protect, uh, you know, basically uh, um, these, these people in the castle. They're called strongholds. And Apostle Paul is saying, we have divine power to destroy the strongholds in your life. Think about it. Right now, regarding your thought process, regarding your internal narratives, there are some strongholds, there are some high walls that need to be demolished, that need to be broken down. Maybe it's by how you were raised, what you experienced, perhaps things that happened to you that you didn't want to happen to you. But just right now, there are certain strongholds in your life there are high walls right now that God wants to break down, but they only can be broken down by his divine power. By his divine power. Verse 5, Paul says, we demolish arguments. I mean arguments. Well, we're all argumentative. We all, we all do this as, as human beings. We understand what it means to argue against something. But inside, again, there are internal arguments about you. You don't really need, you don't really need to read your Bible today. You don't really need to go to church. You don't really need to soap or fast you don't really do that it's okay what we're saying here is that we are to wage war we're to wage war on flawed conclusions based on false assumptions paul is saying we need to do this we need to wage war we have to go after those flawed conclusions that for some reason there's an, there's an argument in our mind and we think it's okay it's been justified with paul that's not good enough we have to wage war against those flawed conclusions because they're not true they're not, they're not right. They're actually illogical and irrational and because they're based off of false assumptions. We haven't got the full picture. So verse 5, Paul says, We demolish arguments and every pretension. Now, pretension means a high thing, okay? A high thing. But Paul is talking about in this context, every piece of arrogance inside of us, conceit, flawed narratives, selfishness, that we are to go after you know, those things and demolish you know, every argument and every pretension, everything that is lifting us up above God, putting us ahead of God, often through, through pride and through, again, you know, logic, we think, oh, I know more, I know more, I know more. But Paul is saying, listen, you don't know more. You don't know more at all. And we have to come back to this point with our strongholds, because there are strongholds in our lives, the obviously strongholds of maybe arrogance or pride or selfishness. There are strongholds of flawed narratives. Um, whatever is in your life, there are strongholds that need to be broken down. And Paul says that sets up itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. So Paul is saying here, we need to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What does that mean? We tackle every narrative, each narrative that tries to stand up against what Jesus said. Whenever... Again, if you're a Christ follower, if whenever you're going through this, your day, and you have these daily thoughts, listen, we all know the reality, when a thought comes into mind, and we go, where did that come from? Why is that there? Why am I entertaining this thought, or this conversation? And if we're not careful, we would allow that thought or conversation to go from here to here. And if we're not careful, then it will cause destruction and cause regret. But Apostle Paul is saying, we are to tackle each narrative. Meaning, if, if Christ is truth, and if you are loved, if you are accepted, if you have belonging, and if you have purpose, then why would you believe that you're not loved, that you're not accepted, that you don't have purpose, and you're a waste of space? So every day, we have these thoughts. Our body tries to come in and say, you're a nobody. You're flawed. You're just a waste of space. You will never amount to anything. Yes, that's what our mind is telling us. But when we read scripture, when we're close to God, we read the contrary. We see the truth. We see what God is truly saying to us through his words. What do we do? We tackle narratives that try to stand up against what Jesus said. So I wonder right now, for every you are in three locations, what are the things that you need to tackle right now in your mind? What are the lies that you need to destroy in your mind? What are the conversations that you just put to bed and say, these conversations are not from God. These thoughts are not of God. And I know the truth. And here's the thing about the truth. The truth is what? The truth sets you. The truth sets you. So if we're not living in truth, we're not living in freedom. True freedom is living in the truth 
knowing who you are in God and what he says about you, church. It's so important. End of verse 5 says, and we take captive of every thought. Take captive of every thought. I don't know if you've ever seen those movies when someone takes, takes a, a prisoner or a hostage. Pretty cool, like how they'll do it. And, you know, take them away and it's all pretty like planned. But like, just that the person being held captive, like they're being taken, they no control. Or you know, maybe you've caught something like a, I don't know, a bee or a fly or whatever you catch in your own life, a flu. You know, whatever you caught, you know what I mean? But the idea is that we take captive, and, and again, Apostle Paul is giving this military language that you take control. You take captive of every thought. You take hold of every flawed narrative. You do not allow it to linger. You do not allow it to wander. You do not want to go back to that time where you were when you know you made your worst choices and worst mistakes. You do not want to go back to that time where you knew you did things you shouldn't have done. Why? Because your mind wandered. You take captive. Why? Because, man, there's so much at stake. Your relationship with your family, with your friends. You do not want it to, to, to wander. You take captive each time. And ultimately, you make it obedient to Christ. You make it obedient to Christ. So as you take captive, you have it. And you go, how does this measure up to Christ? And the Apostle Paul is saying, what you need to do here is, you bend it into conformity. You, bend, you literally shape and manipulate that thought that flawed narrative, and you bend it and you go, how does this relate or add up to what Christ says about me and my life and my future and my sins? Because if I have this tri- uh, uh, triangle shape, and this is, a, this is like, you know, like I say, square, I'm trying to push it in, it doesn't work. I'm going to bend it in and get it through. Why? Because this is what my mind says, this is what Christ says. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is align ourselves to the value system. That has been introduced by Jesus. You can see the challenge the Apostle Paul had here. He's talking to Corinth. He's talking to the church that's been planted and birthed. And there are people there who've come to know Christ. But they're facing the tension and the reality of living in the culture where might make right. Bigger the better. Okay, if the gods are angry, they're going to hurt you. And you know what? If something's wrong, it's your fault. So that was the, the mindset. That was the the, 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 you know, the worldview of the time. And Apostle Paul is now coming in. He goes, hey, you are not to live of the worldview of Corinth. We are to live by the value system of Christ. That's so relevant to us today in Ireland, in Navan, and Dock, here in Dublin. Yes, we're part of Ireland. It's this you know, 21st century secular European country. And yes, we're so blessed to have houses and cars and clothes on our back. But listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. Even though we live in this society, and yes, we adhere to the societal values, okay? But we should not get caught in the trap of trying to live out the world's value system in our lives. We don't conform Christianity into the culture of the world. We conform the culture of the world into Christianity. Whenever it comes to dating, and when everyone says, oh yeah, go date, sleep around, do what you want. Yeah, watch porn, yeah, do what you want. And that's what the world says, what, is, what does Jesus say? What are, the, what are the harmful side effects of doing it? Yeah, drink all you want, smoke all you want. Yeah, don't go to church, you don't read your Bible. Why would you care? Why would you commit? Do what you want. But you know the thing is, at the very end of all those, yeah, do what you want, you are the person who's broken, hurt, and lost. And you go, oh my goodness, I've made a mistake, I've become my own worst enemy. That is the challenge and the tension of trying to live out the world's value system. But actually, matter of fact, what the Paul is saying is that we are to align to the value system that what Christ said. We're to, we're to live our lives as Christ has given us a way to live. It's so important. Because if not, our mind can wander. And if not, we can become our own worst enemy. Like I said, the preemptive habit number two is this is that we want to pay attention to our narratives. Let me ask you a question, church. Have you, have you got any strongholds that need to be demolished? Are there any high walls of conceit, arrogance, shame, unforgiveness, uh, pride, ego, um, you know, uh, idea that like I'm entitlement? Are there certain walls in your life right now that need to be demolished? And the answer is yes. Yes, 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 we all do, I do. Even as a pastor, you go, oh, Sam's so holy, so pious. 
Look at his bald head. Woo, he's a monk. No, I have it every single day. I have it every single day. We all have a narrative going through our mind every single day. It just depends if it's good or bad, or if it's godly or if it's me. But the question I have to ask myself every day, and the question I want to ask you is, what's your narrative behind your thoughts? Like, for example, why don't you make that phone call? Like, you know there's a phone call that you have to make right now to restore a relationship or to forgive someone or to talk to your parents, whatever it may be. But why don't you make that phone call? Why don't you talk to your parents? What happened? Disagreement? An argument? But surely that's not the value system of Christ. Yeah, the world says, yeah, you know what? They don't deserve you. They don't, need, they don't deserve to talk to you. They're this. But what is Christ saying to you? Or why do you get angry so easy? When your wife says this, or when your husband says that, or when your kids do this, or when you're in work and your boss does that, why do you get angry so easy? Or why did you move in with him or her? Like, if you're a Christ follower and you know there, there's a value system that's there to protect you and, and empower you and set you up, but why did you cut a corner and think, if I move in with him and her, it'll all be good, but now you're in trouble because you're pregnant, or you're sleeping around, or he's abusing you, or she's abusing you. You can't get out. You're stuck. Whose fault is that? Yours. Why? Because there was a, a narrative in your mind you thought, maybe he or she'll get saved. Maybe it'll come to church. Maybe. But you're not God. You're just a Christian trying to live in this world with Christ's value system. Why do you hide that secret? Or why are you hiding those secrets? What, who's telling you that if you don't tell those secrets, something will happen? Why are you keeping those things in the dark? Why don't you forgive? This is huge. I, I honestly believe from my own experience, we as Christians who are called to love, that the, the only thing that separates the Christian faith from every other faith and belief is our love. Our love for God and our love for people. But if there is forgive, unforgiveness and bitterness in our heart, we cannot live, love to our fullest capacity. Unforgiveness and bitterness can be a, a, a roadblock. It can be a stronghold that gets in the way of us loving people unconditionally. Why did you stop reading and praying? Couldn't hear God. God was far. Not bothered. I'm too busy. Work is crazy. Family's crazy. Yeah, but you know what's going to happen? You're going to go crazy. Or... Why has God and church become an afterthought? What happened? You were once on fire for God, full of joy, full of excitement, full of vision. But what happened? Did someone in the church hurt you? Did someone say something to you that you didn't like? But come on, we're not part of the values of the world. We're the church. We're, we're broken people who've come together to build God's church. We're normal people. But why, have, why has God and church become an afterthought? See, we all have narratives. My story is this. My narrative is with money. I grew up in a home, youngest of four boys, and my parents were vagabonds. Still are. Bless them. And uh, my parents start off as rock stars, and then my dad changed his career to become a soldier. Not just a soldier, he wanted to become a special forces soldier. So he became part of special forces here in Ireland. Did that. And then his dad died tragically while he was overseas. Kind of like, just that kind of ignited PTSD in him. He came home, and it was like night and day where my dad was once my action man, my, my hero, you know, and he still is now. Back then, it was very hard to understand as a young, young guy, young boy, what was going on. But he came home angry, bitter. You know, he would, you know, he would get, he never, he never laid a hand on us, thank God. You know, that's one he never did, but he would break a wall or he'd break a door down. Like, there was a stage in our life, we had no doors. Like, Jehovah's Witnesses walk past our house. And Jehovah's Witnesses go, no door, okay, bye-bye, you know what I mean? Like, we had no doors. Like, there was one time where my dad put his Harley in our front door, but because he was so badass, no one would come near our house. Because he'd kill you. That, but, but long story short, from all those bad decisions my parents made, you know, money was a big factor. And they, they lived in debt all their life. They lived in debt. They, they bought a house. It was my, my family home. I grew up in it. Great memories. But they had to sell it because they were in debt. And when I was younger, I, I became very bitter with my parents. Because I was like, how can you not do the one thing? 
which is like, look after me and look after your friends. Like, why can't you do this one thing? Like, why, why do all my friends have money? Like, why, why can they buy all these clothes or, or do all these things? Why can't we do, go on that holiday? Why can't we, you know, why can't they come stay in our house because we have no floors in our house or our beds are old? Like, wh- as a young chap and growing up into a teenager, young adult, I really had this flawed narrative of money based on my parents and their experience. And it was this, that I'm never going to spend money excessively. I'm never, I'm never going to borrow. I'm never going to get a credit card. I'm never going to get a mortgage. I'm not going to be controlled by anyone else. I'm going to have my own money and that's it. And I started off noble and I started off right. And it was and it was just because I was a young man. I became saved and I wanted to do, do it right by finances. Then I got married and Sarah came into my life and she had her narrative. And she had her experience. And all of a sudden we were, we were like this. We were you know, pounding heads because cause reality is she was challenging my flawed narrative. She said, yeah, even though that was how your parents were, Sam, and even though that's how they spent money, that's not how you can spend money. You can actually do a better job. But I, I, in that moment, it hit me that I realized, man, my, my decisions, my thought process, my internal conversations were all shaped, when it came to finances and money, were all shaped by, what, by how my parents spent their money. And, and quickly I realized, you know what, I'm good with money. I can actually save and spend. I can be generous, you know. And, and, and I'm thankful for my wife, but there are people around you who are challenging your flawed narratives. And perhaps it is money, or perhaps... Back on again. Okay. Woo. Uh, perhaps it's, it's, I'll say it again. Perhaps it's you know, money or relationships that, you know, how your parents love each other. Maybe your parents are divorced, and now because they're divorced, you think you can never be married because you can't trust someone. Uh, perhaps it's something to do with career. They always worked and they were always gone. And you think, no, I got I to be home every minute, every second, uh, because they were always gone. See, understand, the, the, the narratives we have are often coming from how we were raised, how we were born, and actually affect us. But in conclusion, church, in conclusion, as we land this message, we all have narratives. We all have a narrative. We all have a narrative going on. And we need to decide what kind. What kind of narrative is going on in my mind? Is it good? Is it godly? Does it align to the value system of Christ? Or is it worldly? Is it evil? Is it selfish? And is it bringing me down a road which will ultimately lead me to becoming my own worst enemy? Because when it comes to our narratives, it's it's the same thing. Every habit begins with a first time. Right now you have the habit of thinking a certain way. Right now you have a habit of believing in things because of your thought process. Number two, you have every pattern begins with the first line. You, there's patterns now in your life. Like it's gone from being thoughts to patterns in your life. Okay, and finally, every journey begins with a first step. Here's how we know. The, the, our eternal narratives, our, our flawed narratives can really affect how we live, how we love, how we do life. So lastly, we give you a commitment to the first thing when it comes to how to become the worst enemy. It was this. I will pause until I pinpoint the cause. I will explore rather than ignore. That was last week's. When it comes to my decision making, when it comes to becoming my own ally and not my own worst enemy, I will do these things. I will pause. If I feel like I'm I'm being pushed into a corner that goes against the the value system of Christ, if I somewhat sense red flags and sense things that are going against my conscious, I'm conscious stricken, I'm going to pause. And I'm going to pinpoint cause okay i'm gonna i'm gonna wait i'm gonna take a moment i'm gonna pray i'm gonna seek god i'm not gonna be rushed into this ultimately i'll explore rather than ignore listen there are so many times in our lives if we could go back in time we could we would do this wouldn't we oh when it comes to the finances or your marriage or your work or your education or that person, you would just, you just wish you could go back in time and just pause. Not rush. Don't go in blinded. Oh, I just want to, I want to explore rather than ignore this because this is too serious. This is my life. But today I want to ask you to commit to another, another kind of habit and this is commitment number two. I will demolish every narrative that conflicts with the value system introduced by Jesus. What I'm saying succinctly, church, is that you will get God's truth. This is His truth. Here's who I am and His truth. 
The world says this. But you know what? It doesn't even relate. It doesn't even equate. It doesn't, it doesn't match up. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So what are you going to do? You're going to demolish every narrative, every conflict. You're not going to ignore it. You're not going to pass by it. This week, your goal and your challenge and your commitment is that this week, I am going to demolish every narrative and conflict that comes to my marriage, my, my relationships, my, my family, my, my faith, my, my work colleagues, whatever it may be. You know this week, you need to take time now and demolish those strongholds. Because if not church, listen to me very carefully, in Navin and in Dublin and, and in Dundalk, listen to me very carefully. If you do not apply this, Every day to your life. Number one, you will not know the truth. Which means you will not live in freedom. And number two, you will become your own worst enemy. And you will go down a path with such regret and pain and just remorse. Because you didn't pause to see what the cause is. You didn't stop to explore and not ignore. You you didn't do that. Ultimately, you also didn't demolish those things that you know are getting in the way of you loving and living and thinking and talking. This is our goal for you, church. In January, it's not just like, oh, a a fad for the first month. This is for the rest of your life. Can you imagine what your life would look like if you did this every day? Can you imagine what your life would look like if you lived in truth every single day? You are a child of God, a son and daughter of God. You are set free in Jesus' name. He has a plan and a purpose for you to do great things. He is your protector. He is your provider. He is your Jehovah Jireh. He's got you. He has your back. You don't need to worry. He's your sustainer. You you have an identity. It's in Him. It's all you need to know. No boy, no girl, no man, no woman, no career, no promotion, no car, no house. No thing can fulfill the truth of who you are in Christ. Every day, I'm going to demolish every narrative that conflicts with the value system introduced by Christ. 